would please. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, Hafner family, I'm glad you're with us today. I'll, amen, I'll see you just here in a little bit. Uh, Ephesians, take your Bibles, go to Ephesians 1. I hope everyone has a Bible going to Ephesians chapter 1. We started this last week, Ephesians chapter 1, using um, verse number 3. Uh, the Bible said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So the aim is to bless him who has blessed us. Blessed, blessing him who has blessed us. Now, we look at the blessings. Now, we've already, last week, um, if you'll get a copy of the message, you can put it together with this week. And uh, we, we talked about Paul the Apostle and, and the message and how he was uh, called and as to be an apostle of the Gentiles and so forth. But we look at the blessings in verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Um, so we look, first of all, at the blessings of from our Heavenly Father, the blessings from our Heavenly Father. The Bible says in verse 4, 5, and 6, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. So what's the blessings of God the Father? First of all, He's chosen us. He has chosen us. Now, uh, you have to listen very carefully so you'll go away with the right uh, attitude uh, about uh, what the Scripture has to say and what we do believe here at the Faith Baptist Church. We do not believe that God chooses the elect few uh, for salvation. We do believe that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son and that whosoever, whosoever, Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God hath chosen us. Now, I don't know if uh, we did talk about that last Sunday morning, but this is Sunday school, and I want to give you plenty of scripture. Uh, it's a study. So take your Bibles, if you will, and just follow along with me here just for a minute. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And it would be wise for you to write these down. If you're ever confronted by um, Calvinistic teaching, then you have um, plenty of Scripture. These are not the only verses, but you'll have plenty of Scripture to refute, to refute limited atonement. You see, we, we believe that Jesus Christ died for everyone. We believe the blood of Christ is sufficient for anyone who will believe Christ to go to heaven. Now, the Bible said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, are you there? Verse 10. Um, all of my kids are grown. Thank the Lord for that. Well, at least I think they are sometimes. And, um, yeah, but when they were little, you know, we'd go on a trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So finally, I got tired of hearing it one time. It was our first trip to Florida when my kids were little. And we passed this little bridge, a little swampy thing of water. And they were really anticipating going to the ocean. We were going down to New Smyrna Beach. And they kept saying, are we there yet? And are we there yet? And I said, kids, we're finally here. I said, there's the ocean. And they go, oh, oh, oh boy. You remember that, Kathy? You remember? And I said, no, darling, that's not the ocean. That's just an old swamp. That's one of them Florida swamps. <laughs> but anyway, are you there yet? Are you, in, are you in 1 Timothy? It's important that you get here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, follow along. Verse 10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. You ought to underline that. You ought to underline that. He's the Savior of all men. And then it goes on, the Holy Ghost puts in there, especially of those that believe. Did you know that if you, uh, if anyone... If anyone dies and goes to hell today, they're going to die with a Savior. What does a Savior do? A savior saves. When did Christ redeem or purchase the world at Calvary? We know that. Purchased at Calvary. 
We've got, but uh, if you die without believing Christ, you're going to die in the state you were born in. You'll die in your sin, according to John chapter number 8. You'll die, verse 24, uh, if you believe not that I'm he, you'll die in your sins, what the Bible said. All right, now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, you know, it'd be wise if you had your Bible. Everyone had your Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 12. The Bible said in verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, for how long? Forever. Sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, Jesus Christ died for all sins of all men, none are excluding. Acts chapter number 17, verse number 30. I'm not going to just write it down, but it's a sermon on Mars Hill that Paul said that he has commanded all men everywhere to do what? To repent. All men everywhere. So all are included. The whole world is chosen. Look at, um, let's, let's do turn to 1 John. Now, I'm sure you could put a lot more verses with these, but I'm going to give you just enough there hopefully to whet your appetite. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. Well, if we back up to verse number 9, it'll get it all in the context there. The Bible said, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now he's talking, in verse number 9, he uses we. Who's we? Believers. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please, the Bible never contradicts itself. And I know I'm getting off on just a little rabbit trail, but um, if, you'll, if you'll go to the very next chapter, chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The Bible does not contradict itself, never does. But then in 1 John chapter number 1, in verse number 9, it says, If we confess our sin, then it says in chapter 3, verse 9, that if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. But it's, the, it's that new creature, it's that new creation, the seed in you, the Holy Spirit in you can't sin. He, he can't sin. There's no, no possible way that Christ could ever sin. And the seed in me can't sin. So we're going to go back in Ephesians chapter number 1, and that's the blessing, that's one of the blessings uh, that he's blessed us with, according to Ephesians 1, chapter number 3. Not only has he chosen us, but he has saved us. And then the Holy Ghost of God has sealed us in Ephesians 1. So, but anyway, back to 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 9. So if we read verse number 9, it would see, it would appear on the surface that all we have to do to be forgiven is to do what? Confess. Confess. But if we read verse number 1 and 2 of chapter 2, the Bible said, My little children, these things write, unto, write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, Christ, is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. Not only for ours as saved, but the sins of the whole world. So, why are my sins continually forgiven? Because I confess them or because Christ Jesus is a propitiation? propitiation. Because he's a propitiation. Propitiation means he's a satisfactory sacrifice. He took his blood, Hebrews chapter number 9, put it on the mercy seat in heavens. And as a result of what Christ did, I am forgiven continually. So why do I confess my sin? Didn't say I confess my sin to get saved. Fellowship. It's fellowship. It's fellowship. If I've wronged you, I want to confess it and make it right. And I want my relationship with the Heavenly Father to be right. So confession in verse number 9 is not a salvation passage. I don't care how you twist it or turn it. You can't make it a salvation passage. We're chosen in the Father. 
It begins with God, simply that. And I could give you more verses. The Bible said in John chapter number 15, verse number 16, you have not chosen me, but I have <clears throat> chosen you. Now, let me show you something else. Again, this is Sunday school, and I'm going to show you what seemingly contradictory passages, but there's nothing that ever in the Bible that contradicts itself. If we have a problem with a passage of Scripture, whose fault is it, God's or ours? Well, you know it is. You know it's our fault. It's not God's fault. God's perfect. God's right. God's holy. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, in verse 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Well, if I go to portions of Scripture like 2 Chronicles chapter number 15, verse 2, it says to seek God. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 6, it tells us to seek God while he may be found. While, while he may be found. It, it tells us in Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 8 that the wise man searched. They sought. They sought the Savior. But only after they received the light. They received the light. They studied the Scripture. They were studying the Old Testament Scripture. God put a special light star in the sky and they followed the star. Am I right? They searched. Uh, but God initiated it. Jesus said in John chapter number 5 and verse number 39 to search the Scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life and they are they that testify of me. Now so God initiated it. So Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 11 is in its place. It's in the right place. It's right. It's holy. It's the Scripture. But so is 2 Chronicles 15, 2, Isaiah 55, 6, Matthew chapter 2, verse 8, and John 5, 39. That's part of the Scripture, all right? It is the Scripture. So we're looking at the divine sovereignty of Almighty God, but we're looking at man's responsibility as well. Man's responsibility is to do what? To search, to act upon the light that God has given him. So who initiated it? God. Give me a good verse for that. John what? Chapter 1. Verse 9. John chapter 1 verse 9. Jesus lighteth every man. He lighted every man that, did, that comes into the world. How did Jesus, how did God light every man that comes into the world? Through creation, Romans chapter 1. Through the conscience, Romans chapter 2. Scripture, Romans chapter 3. <laughs> The oracles of God. God has lighted every man. So, if we act upon that light, then we can follow through Scripture that when a person seeks God, what is God obligated himself to do? To give more truth. To give more truth. If you want to know God, if you want to go to heaven, you can find out. You can find out. So, God hath chosen us. Amen. He has initiated it. He has chosen the whole world to be saved. And um, by the way, um, how are we chosen to be saved? Let me give you a good verse on that one. Second Thessalonians. So I think I did this last week. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Excuse me. <clears throat> That's cold weather is not good for us, is it? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, don't miss this one. Look at verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So how did God choose the world to be saved. What did God initiate for the world to be saved? Christ on Calvary and shed his blood, but he chose, you're placed in the family once you believe the truth. That's pretty simple, isn't it? 
So we see the, we see the responsibility of man. You want to... You want another one to go with that? I figured you did. Let's go to Psalm 7. We're in, um, both are essential. Both are taught in the Bible. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility. So that, that really puts a hole in the Calvinistic theory, doesn't it? And by the way, that's all it is, is a theory. I don't agree. Brother Dewey's been dealing with that on the radio. I don't agree with any point of that tulip theory whatsoever. And scripturally, you can deny it and prove it to be untrue. But we're not Armenian either that we think that man can lose what God has given us. Because even the, the scripture that we're in, and I don't know if we're going to get through with it today or not, but in Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 13, the moment you believe Christ, what happens? You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. All right, now, Psalm 7. We're talking about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. The Bible said in Psalm 7, verse 11, God judgeth the righteous, verse 11 of chapter 7, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. Wow. Wow. We, we need to be real careful about saying God's not mad at us anymore. He's not. <laughs> yeah, God's angry with the wicked every day. He's not mad at you on the basis that he took out his wrath on Christ 2,000 years ago. But did you know, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we should walk, Christians should walk to please God. And if we don't please God, then what does God do as a as a as a son of God, as a, as a daughter or son of God. He'll discipline you. Um, I love my children, but I get angry with them. I get angry uh, with my grandchildren sometimes. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know it. Bless her little heart. She, I said something the other day. You, did you hear her the other day? Back there, I said something about Briley, and she just... I, and she said, bad, Papa. Right. But she's anyway, she's sick today. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Psalm 7. God judgeth the righteous, verse 11, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against his persecutor, the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he, which he made. Are, are you seeing, examine this particular passage. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealings shall come down on his own, play, on his own pate. Hmm. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Well, again, you're looking at divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Here they had a choice. These people in Psalm 7, they had a choice to go which way they wanted to go. So we believe in, in human responsibility. All right, now, not only has God chosen us, Ephesians chapter 1, we're back in the, our text, he hath chosen us, but he has also adopted us. Verse 5. I think it's where we left off last week. The Bible said, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Not only has he chosen us, he has adopted us. Now, predestination in verse number five refers to what God does for the saved people. It's predestined that if a person trusts Christ as his Savior, it's predestined that what's going to happen to him? He's adopted. He, he is adopted. Now, we, we, knew, we know too that um, adoption is... It's, uh, present, and it's also yet future. It's present in that my standing in God is as an adult son. This is where we left off last week. When, 
And I was adopted when I was seven, seven years old. When I was adopted, um, I was not given an adult standing. I had to wait till I'm 18 or 21, whatever the law says, to, to receive my inheritance or to, to get the benefits. I mean, I got the benefits of, of my stepfather loving me and taking care of me, but I didn't get the benefits legally as far as if something ever happened to him until I was an adult. Did you know the moment that you trust Christ, you're placed as an adult son? And so therefore you can claim all of the blessings. Immediately, you don't have to wait to get in on heavenly places. All right, now, but also in Romans chapter 8, um, look at Romans 8. Everyone turn over to Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, um, verse uh, 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, Waiting for the adoption to wit. What is the adoption to wit? The redemption of the body. So I'm waiting. I know it's predestined that when he comes back, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that I'm going to look like he looks. I'm going to be like he is. And what is that? A glorified body. No infirmities. I'm going to have a glorified body just like Christ has right now. When he rose again from the dead, he rose bodily. He has a glorified body. I'm going to have a body just like Christ. And so are you if you're saved. So not only has he chosen us, he has adopted us. And in verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible said, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're predestined to the adoption, verse 5, and then verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. So not only, not only am I um, chosen and I'm adopted, but I am, and you are, accepted. Accepted in Christ. It's a position that will never, ever, 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 ever. I can't say that enough. It will never, ever change. It will never change. We did not make ourselves acceptable to God, but only He, by, him, by His grace, made us acceptable in the Beloved, in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ satisfied every demand of the law of a holy God. Jesus satisfied that law. And as a result, we're accepted in the beloved. We, we are accepted. A person again, and you can, you can look at it, and I'm not going to really, that's not the subject today, but a person doesn't go to hell because of his sin. A, a person goes to hell because he dies in the state of unbelief. Now, if, if, if if you get that statement and you believe that statement, that's a good statement. But if you don't believe it, you need to research why you don't believe it. Because your sin, every, every bit of your sin, I'm going to ask you that I have a big question mark. When God made Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21, when God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Did God leave any sin out that He did not lay on Christ? He put every bit of man's sin on Christ and judged Christ for your sin. That's what He did. If God judged you for your sin, it would be double jeopardy. 
God judged Christ for your sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now notice this next part in chapter 5, verse 19 of 2 Corinthians. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Why, and, but hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Why will God not impute to man his transgressions and trespasses and sins? Because he committed or them, he imputed them to Christ 2,000 years ago. I've had people read that scripture and say, well, that's only to the saved. That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If it's to every man, if, if, if Jesus Christ is a propitiation for our sin, saved people's sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, how can you twist it and say that Christ did not pay the sin debt for the entire world? And then there's a lot of people, and I, this is Sunday school now, you, can, you, can, you don't have to agree with everything I say, but just listen, please. A lot of people think when they come down here, and we do have altar calls at the Faith Baptist Church. I, we do. We, we want you to come if you've got something on your heart, and we want to help you, take our Bibles and help you. But there's a lot of people in Baptist realms, and I am a Baptist. I, I'm a Baptist. I, I've been a Baptist for a long, long, long time. Um, I went to the old, and I mean, for, for, to, to get my credentials that I'm a Baptist, wasn't a saved man, but I did go at that particular time. But I started at Tennessee Temple University and graduated back when Dr. Lee was still there. I like the Baptist principles, the Baptist distinctives. I like it all. And, and uh, I swallowed things hook, line, and sinker without studying the Bible. I did it because some man said it. Yeah. But a lot of people think when they walk the aisle that this is where God takes care of sin. But what that individual... And then... And then when that individual leaves the altar and goes on in life, he, he's, his, 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 his mind goes like this. It's like a yo-yo. He's saved as long as he's around people that have the same testimony. But when it gets to the scripture, he starts doubting. And he'll say, oh, it's all right. The devil makes you doubt. Why would the devil want to make you doubt something, especially if you're a churchgoer? If you doubt something, what's the natural response of somebody that really wants to go to heaven? Search. To search. To search. Why would the devil want to make you search the scripture? Well, they, and, and a lot of people think this is where their sin was dealt with. And you ask them why they're going to heaven. And they say, because I prayed the prayer. Or I went forward during a church service. My friend, you're going to go to heaven. Look at if, while you're in Ephesians, look at verse 13. In, in chapter 1, underline it, dissect it. In whom ye also trusted, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth. You ever heard this testimony? Well, I didn't know what the preacher said and don't know what I believe, but God saved me when I was seven. According to this verse, you couldn't trust him till you heard something. What did you have to hear? Well, look at it. Dissect it. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What's the gospel of your salvation? Death, burial, and resurrection. The good news of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and a salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For verse 17 of Romans 1, for therein is revealed what? The, it, where is revealed the righteousness of God? In the gospel. So anyone that says they're preaching the gospel that does not reveal Jesus Christ as God becoming man, going to Calvary, the sinless lamb without blemish, dying for your sin in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And he shed his blood for the remission of sin and he rose again for your justification. Anyone that says they believe the gospel and does not believe that gospel, the good news of Christ, the righteousness of God who is Christ, is not saved. 
It says that you believe after you heard. After you heard, you had to hear the truth. Uh, well, I say you saved after that what? Look at verse uh, 13. What's the last part of that verse? After that ye believe. What did you believe when you said you believed? Um, we were sitting in church one day and it's time to close. I'm not going to get through. We're chosen by the Father. We're adopted. We're selected by the Father. Did you know the Son salvaged us? Here's you an outline. The Son salvaged us and we were sealed by the Spirit. So the Trinity was at work in your salvation. Chosen by the Father, selected by the Father, salvaged by the Son, saved by the Son, and sealed by the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity was work. But anyway, um, let me close with this story. I probably already told you a couple of times. And, um, a long time ago, my wife and I was uh, in church, sitting in church, and we heard a message. We heard a message about the blood of Christ and how that Christ was a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And the invitation was given and we sit there. Then the next day, she came to me and she said, uh, if... If what that man is saying is true, I'm not saved. That's what my wife told me. And I love my wife more than life. I, I do. That's, uh, I've been, she's been mine for, we've been married 42 years. But we courted back in high school. And, uh, but I love my wife more than life. And uh, I said, darling, you're all right. I said, all you need, listen to me now. I said, all you need is some assurance. So I go through assurance verses. You know, I opened my Bible and went through some assurance verses. And she looked at me this time, in the same setting, but looked at me this time with tears running down her eyes, and she said, David, she said, if what that man's saying is true, I'm not saved. Did you know, did you know that I didn't have a thing to give her? Why? Because I was empty as a gourd myself. I'd went through some motions. Empty as a gourd. Y'all know what a gourd is, don't you? Yeah. Empty as a gourd. Well, make a long story short, I began to search, and in searching, I found him. I found him. It's not like he was lost. But the Bible said, if you'll search with all your heart, you will find him. I found him where, he, where, where, where he's always been in the very pages of life. I found him. I found out what he did was sufficient, and I told my wife. I, I began to share with her about what Christ has done. Um, maybe you're like that today. Uh, maybe you're in the same situation, and you just really need to get serious with yourself and serious with God. And don't die and go to hell. Don't you die and go to hell for anybody. Don't you do it. I don't care how long you've been sitting in these pews. Don't you do it. You don't have to. You can, you can trust Christ as your Savior. Well, I'm done. Let's stand our... Well, you don't have to stand your feet. You're dismissed. Let's pray. Father.